Welcome, everybody. Go ahead and get started. Uh, if I seem distracted for just a second, that's because I'm mid admitting people who are uh, coming through the waiting room. My name is Greg Reich, and I am the director of the Center for Popular Music here at Middle Tennessee State. Welcome to all of you. Uh, also, on behalf of my uh, co-host and co-convener, Dan Margulies of uh, Virginia Wesleyan University. You're going to hear from Dan in just a second. I want to thank all of you for being here. Thanks to uh, our featured speakers, and uh, they'll be introduced to you in just a moment. I also want to thank uh, Tiffany Minton, who is a graduate student here at MTSU in public history and a graduate assistant at the Center for Popular Music. She is helping us with the uh, facilitation of uh, the Zoom operations to make sure everything runs smoothly. We've got a large group today, which is wonderful to see. And uh, Tiffany's going to help us keep everything uh, on track um, technically. So a few things I want to uh, uh, tell you about, kind of housekeeping things, and I'll turn things over to Dan to introduce our featured uh, speakers today. Um, I want to remind you, first of all, that this is the second in a series of three uh, unconferences. The final one will be on April 16th, which is also Friday. Not sure what time, and the, um, the panel is still coming together. Uh, but I can tell you that the April 16th topic of discussion will be community and sustainability in the uh, contemporary old time scene. So I hope you will uh, join us for that. Look for announcements. Wherever you saw the announcement for this one, whether it was Facebook or Twitter or someplace else, uh, you can look to the same location for the April event. Um, this session is being recorded. Uh, for archival purposes, but also with the intent to uh, share on the Center for Popular Music's YouTube channel, as we did with the uh, first event. Um, so uh, you should have all indicated your, um, your consent to be recorded and for that recording to be shared later on, but I also want to make that announcement public up front. Now, we call this an unconference quite deliberately because we are uh, trying to move away from the typical panel format uh, that we've all become accustomed to, especially on Zoom over the last 12 months, in which we have a few featured speakers who spend most of the session uh, doing the talking, and then we have a short Q&A at the end. We wanted to get away from that and give more opportunity and more space to all of you to weigh in whether you have ideas, questions, anything that you want to contribute uh, whatsoever. Now, we have a large number of participants, which is wonderful. So I apologize up front if we are not able to get to everyone, uh, but hopefully we will. Uh, last time we had a big crowd too, and things um, worked out quite nicely. So I have, I'm similar, similarly optimistic about today. Please note that you can also use the chat uh, for um, any kind of comments or questions, whether you want it to be something that is uh, read aloud or you just want it to be kind of a separate conversation and a separate track. Uh, either way, um, again, last time in February uh, for the uh, unconference, we had quite a lively kind of side discussion going on in the chat. And that was also saved and shared um, uh, on YouTube along with the uh, video recording itself. So keep that in mind. I encourage you to use the chat uh, if you're so inclined. We do want to keep the focus today on old time music here in the 21st century. Um, naturally, we might talk about um, you know historical aspects as they relate to the topics of uh, race, class, and gender. Uh, but our primary focus, I hope, will be on um, the scene today and what's happening today in old time music. With this overarching set of topics of race, class, and gender, of course, we might get into some possibly contentious uh, discussions and conversations, and that is okay and that is welcome. Some, you know, these are not necessarily um, comfortable topics. 
all the time for us to discuss. I just ask that everyone treat uh, others with respect and courtesy. We welcome all viewpoints, but we also uh, ask that they um, be expressed in a courteous and respectful manner. I also want to say that uh, while we're very happy about the enthusiasm uh, for these events that's come from the well-known and well-established voices in the old-time community, uh, Dan and I also created these events specifically with a goal to uh, encourage younger members of the community and others who, for whatever reason, might not feel as comfortable um, expressing themselves in such a forum. We want to create a space in which uh, those kinds of folks do feel comfortable and we invite you to, uh, to speak up. Um, now, how is that gonna work? Well, we're gonna start the discussion with our panelists and after about 15 minutes or so, we will open it up to the audience so that we can spend the bulk of our time together with this open discussion involving uh, everyone who wants to contribute. If you do want to contribute in some way, um, I ask that you raise your virtual hand using the Zoom raise hand function. If you're not familiar with that, I can point you to the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, if you click on that, you'll see a raise hand uh, function there. That's how we, including Tiffany, can know that you uh, uh, want to uh, participate actively in the conversation. Uh, and then we can turn your mic on when, it, when there's uh, space for you uh, to talk. So I ask that you stay muted and let us control the um, muting and unmuting of your microphone, please. Uh, please be courteous of sharing time with others because we have such a large crowd and we might have a lot of people who want to say something uh, please keep that in mind and sort of, uh, you know, gauge your the length of your comments or questions um, appropriately. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to co-host Dan Margulies. Take it away, Dan. Okay, thanks, Craig. Thanks uh, to all of you. Can you all hear me or no? You can hear me. Um, cool. So thanks to everyone for coming. So many uh, people. It's great. It's great to see a lot of people I know through academics or music or don't know. So happy to hear from everybody. And thanks to our panelists. So I'm going to introduce the three of them and then I'm going to throw out a question. And then ideally, uh, that'll that'll be my whole role besides listening. So uh, I'm going to introduce them um, alphabetically. So first we have Tatiana Hargraves. Uh, over the past decade, Tatiana Hargraves has been on the forefront of an up-and-coming generation of old-time bluegrass and new acoust acoustic musicians, from placing first at the Clifftop Appalachian Fiddle Contest to her bluegrass fiddling on Lori Lewis's Grammy-nominated The Hazel and Alice Sessions. Hargraves shows a musical fluency that flows between old-time and bluegrass worlds with ease. She currently tours with ban banjo extraordinaire Allison DeGroot and teaches bluegrass fiddle at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, next, we have Kimberly Mack, who's an assistant professor of African American literature and culture at the University of Toledo. Her book, Fictional Blues, Narrative Self-Invention from Bessie Smith to Jack White, was recently published by the University of Massachusetts Press. Kimberly's second book, The Untold History of Early American Rock Criticism about the BIPOC and white women authors who helped develop American rock journalism in the 1960s and 1970s, is under contract with Bloomsbury. She's also a music critic and a memoirist whose work has appeared in Long Reads, No Depression, and other places. And finally, we have Amanda Martinez, who's a PhD candidate in the history department at UCLA, where she's completing a dissertation on race and the country music industry from the 1970s to the 1990s. Her work has appeared in the Journal of Popular Music Studies in California History and also uh, in the Washington Post uh, just uh, not too long ago. So, um, so the, the question we're gonna start with is based on an idea, we all had a discussion a week or so ago and we talked a lot about this idea of reclamation. And so I wanna ask what is being reclaimed and why? And related to that, how does confronting the real histories of the music, the cultures that contributed to it, uh, help us to map out 
uh, where it's going in the 21st century. And any of you all can take that. I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll start. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to see such a large crowd. Um, these issues of reclamation, I think with my work, I am really interested in thinking about, you know, of course we know how old time music was established as music supposedly for just white people, which was in the twenties when it was created as a marketing category. Um, but my research really looks to think about how that has been upheld um, from the perspective of the industry. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I try to highlight um, to center black and brown artists in particular and listeners um, and to highlight certain periods um, where they really kind of shook the, the popular narrative that in, in my case, country music, which of course evolved out of old time music, uh, was purely white. Um, so that that's what my research focuses on. And I think bringing it up to the present is in terms of country music, we're seeing the most incredible um, reclamation effort, I think that uh, country music has ever seen, it's especially on the part of, of black women artists, writers and fans. Um, so yeah. I will, uh, I will go next. <laughs> I have a few things to say. Um, so yeah, I mean, along those lines, there's a, you know, a, a person who everyone here knows, uh, Rhiannon Giddens, who I think is a really good example of somebody who is doing some of this work, who's contemporary in different scenes and different Americana scenes. Um, and, but she, I think what's interesting about Rhiannon Giddens is the way in which she's doing some of this reclamation work. And in particular, she has taken on this role of educator. And, um, and this is something that she was doing when she was with Carolina Chocolate Drops. Um, and, and it's something that she's done with Our Native Daughters, which is of course that project with her and, um, other black women who play banjo. Um, and her reclamation has been everything from, of course, um, making sure that audiences uh, understand the black string tradition and understand that um, country music and other forms of music that has been considered white, um, you know, really has black origins and has, and she has done this work to reclaim country music, for instance, is black. Um, and then also with our native daughters, she's she has worked to kind of recuperate the banjo, which from her perspective, a lot of people, um, a lot of black folks in particular have been wary of because of its connotations with minstrelsy and chattel slavery. Um, but again, I think what's most interesting about, it's not just her reclamation and her very loud and vocal reclamation, which is important and great, but I, but I think what's really striking is the way she does it and um, in, in being and in taking on this role as educator. And then in her various keynotes, she's had a, a number of recent keynotes where she actually acts as scholar and uh, does that work, does that, does that, you know, she's kind of like scholar artist or artist scholar where she actually does um, the deep historical work and so that um, the things that she says are not just um, not solely rooted in in her own um, work as an artist and as a and as a and as a um, musician and as a singer, but it's also rooted in this deep um, sort of historical research that she has done. And I think that that is useful because what it does is it helps to bring this out of the realm of okay, yeah, we just need more people, more representation, um, which can sometimes be more along lines of tokenism, but I think in re-educating people and actually having people understand the underpinnings of a lot of the musics that are considered to be white, whether it's country music um, or whatever, um, 
she's actually doing, I think, the work to help people to, to sort of reshape the ways in which we're thinking about what this music even is and who should be participating in it and who should be welcomed into it. Um, and again, who are the foundational figures for a lot of these musics. So, you know, I think, I think Rhiannon Giddens is somebody who's reclaiming stuff, but I think also what's interesting is thinking about how she's doing it and maybe um, this is something that um, folks might want to talk about um, how how we reclaim things and how do we do it in a way where it becomes structural and it becomes a rethinking of these ideas around you know who does the music legitimately whose music is it etc versus just kind of thinking about well let's have one more person or two more people out here yeah that's all i have to say about that <laughs> Well, I feel like there's not much more to be said. Um, that covers a lot. Um, I guess just to reiterate, like black and indigenous people of color and queers like have always been a part of this music and that's what is being reclaimed. It's not that this is some new trend. It's that this is how it's always been. Um, but as Amanda was saying, uh, the industry has and people in power have rewritten what is visible. Um, so that's what's being reclaimed, just to, to clarify. And um, I wanted to kind of expand on what Kim was saying about how um, figures like Rian and Giddens are doing this um, and the, taking on the role of educator. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and that's definitely, I think, a trend right now is as a performer, you're not just performing this music, you're also in a place of re-educating and um, that's kind of a part, become a part of, I think, old time performance in the 21st century is this kind of um, educational bit. And that's always the question is how much are you presenting the information on stage? How do you incorporate it into the performance? And then how does that translate off of the stage? Is that something that people just see as a performance um, or are they actually taking that information? So maybe a further question would be, how does that information get off the stage or out of the panels, out of the workshops and become more of a, like a standard um, well of knowledge um, and something that doesn't need to be presented as much. But that's definitely, I think, something that you see a lot of these days in performances um, is this kind of educational, um, especially with black and indigenous old time musicians today. I think you see a lot of that educational component um, in the performance. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say for right now. Seeing no hands jumping in, I thought maybe I'd kind of follow that up with a question from what you were saying, especially this idea of uh, you know, reclaiming things so they become structural, as Kim said, or, you know, the old time performance and the educational part of it. So I'm just wondering how, uh, you know, how can you can play old time music today, you know, in the, in the kind of age of racial justice reckoning and the era of Black Lives Matter and Me Too and George Floyd. So, and, and related to that, does old time music have to be didactic or can it just be music? Uh, without that component. Let's open this up to anyone. Uh, panelists certainly welcome to weigh in on this, but anybody else uh, who would like to speak, just uh, put up your virtual hand and we'll give you a chance. I'll just say again that I don't think this is anything new. Um, these um, have always been issues and questions in the old time community. I think they're just becoming more visible now. And, um, you know, talking to people who have been in the old time community for a while, these are not new questions. Um, so yes, um, now is, I mean, any time is a good time to, to, to question and to figure out what, what we're doing, but I don't think this is anything new. And if it's new for some people, then that's really exciting. I'm, I'm so happy that, that we're at a place where we can be having this many people talking about it. Um, but I don't think that 
overall within old time music, it's, it's um, something that's significantly different. These, these things have always been. This is supposed to be a helpful silence in case you were uh, <laughs> a productive silence, you know, but don't be, don't be afraid to be the first to speak. You know, it's. I think we have a hand. Hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the panel. I was just thinking of, you know, the responses and I was thinking about when um, I was first starting to, you know, think about country music, <laughs> way back no, then, <laughs> way back when, but the scholarship, um, like Karen Lynn's book on the banjo, right, and and the narratives, Charles Wolfe's early uh, scholarship, saying there was there were a lot of black string band ensembles that just simply didn't get recorded, right? We just don't, we didn't have the the sonic record that we you know, had with the, Smith, the Smithsonian collection, for example. But there was, I just, you know, so like this idea was, this has always been part of the conversation, even though the industry has had its own historical take. I think there's always, there has always been that evidence, right? The banjo before it becomes part of minstrelsy has this huge rich history that has to do with black music making before it's appropriated. So I, so I think it's always been there, you know, and um, early scholars and folklorists and musicians have always commented and pointed to that very engaging and cultural like confluence, right, in vernacular music that cannot be neatly divided by, by race and gender and sexuality. It looked like maybe Pete had their hand I, up. I'm trying to, yeah, I don't know if I'm allowed to <laughs> speak, but I'm gonna go. Um, so I, what I was really intrigued with with the opening was the idea that we're seeing the emergence of people like Rhiannon and, and Don Flemons who kind of serve the role of like public intellectuals. And, you know, I think, I think like what uh, Stephanie's saying is totally on. Like, I think that, you know, and I, I teach this class on, oh brother, where art thou? And I love how Marissa Moss recently kind of pointed out that, um, and I didn't even realize this myself until she pointed it out, but you know, the soundtrack of that has a lot of African-American artists and really digs deep into that, even if the movie isn't so great in its portrayal of a lot of issues. Um, and that's kind of what I dig into in the class, but um, you know, then what happens? Country radio refuses to play it, even though it's a hit, right? <laughs> it's a huge hit, right? And they don't play it. And I think that it really, it, it's come down to, it's really, we have to have these sort of public intellectuals who are willing to go out and stick their necks out and talk about it. And I don't know, I mean, I think academics, maybe we're not the ones to do it. <laughs> maybe it's these people who already have that audience, you know, I don't know. What do y'all think? It's <laughs> a good question, Pete. Um, Laura, I think you were waiting next. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, it's not a hugely well-formed question, um, but I'm, I'm really um, struck by the question about does old time have to be didactic or should it be about the music? I've thought a lot about this in my research and spent a lot of time stalking message boards of old time musicians responding to um, uh, taking minstrel tunes out of the out of the jam session repertory, th those sorts of debates. Um, many, many people are saying it's just music, but it's, I just think that's a, such a privileged position to take to say it's, it's just music. Music has a um, huge impact on, on, on all kinds of, um, well, on life in so many ways. So I think that, um, again, not a very well-formed question, but 
I think especially the people in this room who have come to a debate like this, perhaps it is our responsibility to call these things out, to bring up those awkward discussions, say like, maybe we shouldn't be playing this tune, or maybe if we do play this tune, we should be playing it in context. And it reminds me of um, at one summer at Augusta, old time week, um, a few years ago, um, one of the class were with them, um, were learning um, minstrel banjo tunes and really, really deep context um, of, of that. And then, um, so in this very, very academic setting, in instructional setting, and then they were being also being played on, the tunes were being played from the class on the porch in social hours. And like hearing them outside of the frame of that class for, um, for a musician of color whom, whom I was with, um, he said that this was very, very awkward. And it was also awkward for, for many of others as well in the group. So I, yeah, I think this is a very roundabout way of saying that I think that those of us who will show up to something like this, it perhaps it can't not be didactic or in our approach to it. I wonder if you can run a poll of uh, take a, a piece like Golden Slippers, uh, which uh, has a, a fairly horrid history or Lass's trombone. How many would play it without content, context? How many wouldn't play it at all? How many would play it, but with an explanation, a description? Good point. Craig, go ahead. You've been waiting patiently. It does, it does uh, seem like there, you know, there's this divide between playing music in, in public settings where you don't have any context and in more educational settings and, and questions that range from, if you're playing a very obscure tune as opposed to, you know, Golden Slippers that has minstrel roots or minstrel show roots that nobody in the bar that's listening to the jam session will recognize at least in the sessions i've been playing with we've we've uh we've been starting to scratch those as well um on the other hand when you're in uh in, in these educational settings there's you know there's so much more opportunity to dig deep i've my, my background is uh presenting historical music in a museum setting and, and not old time music, but uh, sea shanties, which of course have apparently taken the world by storm in the last month and a half. But uh, the, when I first started doing that job, which was over three decades ago, I was immediately struck by the, the fact that it just as is true of old time music, it's a, a genre in which the popular conception is that it's white music, when in fact it's, roots are entirely in African-American music. So that's been a, you know, a mission that I've been on for many, many years in an educational setting where people come with strong preconceptions about what they're gonna see and what they're gonna, what they're gonna hear. And, and uh, it's led to a lot of really interesting discussions and, and the development on my part of strategies to bring people into it without making them feel like they're being confronted while at the same time also uh, making sure that I'm not uh, alienating people of color who have come to the, you know, the, the scheduled concert presentation and feeling like they're being put on the spot just because they happen to be there and they happen to be people of color. So, you know, just this, this, uh, it is, there, there's such a range of, of ways to approach it. But uh, the other thing I was, I was uh, thinking of was that in the revival performance world, there's always been this uh, practice of narrating where you lot learned the tune. And, and for, for many performers, especially performers who learned music from, old time old timer source musicians it's sort of a form of authentication right that that 
I learned this from this old timer. So my performance has a degree of authenticity to it. And that's another uh, interest, just an interesting area to, to look at as it shifts from doing that and, and sort of participating in those earlier uh, popular culture concepts of what the music is to starting to dig into the more complicated background of the actual basis of the historical basis of the music and its development. And, but that the fact that that practice exists does give you a certain avenue into opening up those discussions when you're in that performance setting. And even when, you know, and, and uh, the, the other kind of setting I'm, I'm currently really interested in is, is just when you're doing public jam sessions in a bar, in a, you know, or, or other, other places, when people come up and ask you about, you know, because they don't know what this music is exactly, uh, developing techniques to, to start to open up these, these questions in ways that make people, that draw people in and make them curious and, and uh, receptive. I just want to mention here, there's already um, some discussion going on in the chat about, uh, and some of this was, was mentioned also by people who've been speaking about uh, avoiding certain tunes and where does a person or a group, a jam, whatever it may be, where, where's, where do they decide to draw a line and based on what? And so my question, which is a general one just to, to chew on, I'm going to get to Tommy here in just a second, but I, you know, the, the, the question I just want to put out there is, can we essentially scrub old time music by avoiding tunes that have uh, offensive titles or explicitly racist uh, historical associations? And does that mean that the rest of it is okay? Uh, if a tune does not come out of the minstrel tradition and doesn't have, uh, you know, lyrical or, or a, a titular, uh, you know, offensive word in it or something, does that mean, oh, it's okay, check mark, we can play this one and we're all good? Is it, it's, it struck me that it's never been, it shouldn't be quite that simple. But I just want to put that out there. So let me turn to Tommy. He doesn't need to answer my question. Tommy can say whatever he wants to say. Go ahead. Hey, Greg, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Um, hey, Tatiana. Um, I'm veering back and forth between two aspects of it. I think I'll go with the most interesting thing that I'm working on now, which has to do with Lucy Smith Stanley, the mom of Ralph Stanley, uh, who in my view, has never gotten the sort of attention that other mentors for um, other key musicians have gotten. But she taught Ralph to play. She taught him a bunch of songs to the degree that he did an album called Songs My Mama Sang. And then if you start looking at the individual songs, there's particularly one um, called Shout Little Lula, which turns out to have extremely clear and documented African-American um, associations. And so I've, what I'm looking for is trying to recreate the sort of network of influence and style that she operated in, which turned out to have a huge influence on what in my view is, is actually the best of the, the early bluegrass groups, the, the Stanley brothers. So, and I've, you know, I've known for many years that Ralph's mom taught him to play, but I was, my understanding of this was also illuminated by seeing a bit of film of Earl Scruggs playing um, the banjo at a family gathering. And next to him were two of his sisters. And you always hear about Junie and the other brother who played banjo. And here's these two women just getting it on um, rhythm guitar who have never been brought up as individual people, rather just as relations of this one key person. So I guess it's an admonishment to myself to keep my ears and, and thoughts open 
more thoroughly when looking into stuff like this because there are I mean in fact my publisher um, for this projected book said you know look, look for some of these aspects and you'll find them and indeed um, that worked out it's, it's become one of the most fascinating things to this book on uh, the Stanleys and their roots and their influence so that's all I got Thanks. We got a couple of our our panelists. We want to jump back in. Y'all go ahead, Amanda and then Tatiana. Oh, sure. Yeah, Greg. I wanted to touch on your question, which is, I think, a really important point because I think that on the one hand, we can talk about, in terms of old time music, explicitly racist uh, songs, but that ignores the fact that this is a man made category that's fundamentally built on racial exclusion. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point. So is is there any any type of old time music that isn't racist um, historically? Um, but when it comes to those very explicitly openly racist songs, I do not believe it's appropriate ever for a white person to perform those songs. Um, you know, I mean, it, it reminds me of you know every so often the debate comes up like, can we use the N-word in the classroom? And I think just across the board, no. <laughs> it's it's something that, you know, it is going to be harmful to, to students regardless of whether you might think so or not. So um, I thought that that was a really good question, Greg. And kind of expanding on that, I think oftentimes when we have discussions about race and old time music and the racist origins and contemporary racism in old time music, it always gets stuck at this point of what tunes can we play? What tunes can't we play? And I think that's a distraction from the real issues. Like Amanda was saying, like what isn't racist in old time music when it has become a racialized category um, or it always has been. Um, so maybe the questions shouldn't be what can and can't we play because it's pretty cut and dry. Like, don't say the N-word, like don't play a tune. Um, and there's plenty of other tunes out there. <laughs> like it's not that hard to find other tunes, you know? And it's not that hard to find, especially now with Google, not that hard to find like other sources that aren't um, playing those tunes. So I think that's a distraction from more important questions um, that really need to be addressed. Um, and we can talk more about like, what are those other questions? But I think it's really easy to get stuck at this point of what tunes can and can't we play. And I think it's just looking for an exception to feel good about like, oh, well, we can play this tune, but we, you know, so um, I think it is an important thing to talk about because yes, there are definitely repertoire that we should stop playing but I think it's time to go past that point in these discussions because every time, like I did another panel a few months ago and the same thing happened, we got stuck at this question of what tunes can and can't we play. Kim, go ahead. Uh, well, so I raised my hand and I unraised it because um, I, I was kind of moving the conversation a little bit somewhere else but um so drew ferguson had something in the chat about the whole public intellectual thing again that concept and um and maybe this is also building on that a little bit and kind of again coming back to the bigger picture and and again thinking about um artists um who in their role as music makers can again have some of these conversations with audiences and in kind of move beyond, um, you know, just the, you know, what are we playing to again, what are the, what are the underpinnings of this music? Where does it come from? Where, who, you know, whose music are, you know, whose music is this or who, where does it come out of um, that sort of thing. So, but also um, just this idea of the whole public intellectual and this idea of it being inclusive. Um, somebody, asked, I can't remember who it was, if it makes sense to have artists doing this work and not scholars doing this work, or at least obviously scholars are going to do this work, but 
but academics are going to do this work, but does it, is it, is it, can an artist get the message out in a way that's going to touch audiences better than an academic might? And, you know, I think that's a fantastic question. And coming back to Giddens again, what's so interesting about her though, is that she really is tapping into academic work in the work that she's doing. Um, you know, for some of the keynotes that she's done, she has work cited pages with, you know, academic uh, historical works. And so she's finding a way to kind of bring that into her artistic expression um, and, and performance. And so I don't know if it has to be either or, you know, uh, perhaps it's both. Uh, but, I, but I also really do like this idea of artists feeling comfortable talking about these issues, even with audiences, because I think that's the way you get beyond, ideally, this is very idealistic, but that's at least a step towards, again, moving beyond just um, what can you play, what can't you play, or, you know, is this song racist, is that song not racist, but really kind of starting to have these bigger picture conversations about the category, about where these music, where the banjo comes from, about, you know, black string music, all of this stuff. Um, I think that has the opportunity to move the next generation forward faster than kind of worrying about, yeah, individual songs and, um, or thinking about the industry, adding one more person to a label, you know, one person of color. Um, but again, coming to the bigger, larger structural issues. And, and I think education really can help with that. I wanted to add on that and maybe uh, poke the bear a little bit and just kind of ask like the, the public intellectual idea, it seems to me like it might create a such a privileged position that it it makes it, it just challenges the whole concept of old time music, folk music, the people's music, people playing the music. And so, I mean, I'm an academic and a musician, so and whatever hat you wear most or something, but I'm just wondering what happens to a people's music if it's reduced to or elevated to something that has to be interpreted by a privileged group of selected uh, artisans and, 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 and public intellectuals and or has to be explained in a uh, schematic way every time it's performed. And, and I'm, I'm actually asking this, this was one of the questions that Greg and I kind of animated this idea. It's like, here it is, this era we're in, how can you play this music? I mean, I play other kinds of music that seem to me less fraught with uh, white supremacy the way old time is. So, but does that mean that one cannot play this music at all unless they are in one of these emerging categories? So I'm asking that deliber deliberately to be a bit provocative, but also because I'm wondering. I'd like to just jump in here because I was the one who put the comment in the chat. And um, um, I, I guess, um, some of the earlier comments were about academic and scholarly work and and I'm a member of of I'm a scholar I'm not a member of academia officially and so I felt that that could be very exclusive um, and I actually liked the public intellectual idea not because it was exclusive and I see how you could argue that it might be but because I thought that it was something that was definitely less exclusive than academic or scholarly, and that it can include people who are musicians who want to dig deeper, because I don't really see a dichotomy there. Um, I think someone else used the word curiosity, and I think there's a kind of studied curiosity that a person can have that has nothing to do with the name, you know, like some kind of highfalutin intellectual or scholar or academic. So that just to clarify my point. John. Uh, yeah, can you hear me all right? 
Um, I, I was going to kind of expand on on what Dan was asking, and uh, I mean, should we play old time music at all? I mean, the everything is is fraught in the music, and and just the fact that whether uh, you know the name of a tune marks its racist origins. I mean, the whole the whole genre is the style is. I mean, a tune with a, a non-racist name could be used in a in a racist or, or a, a dark origin. I mean, the, the the music and the culture is just so fraught. I mean, do we should we as a community do we need to think about looking at, at the other options? At that point, too, there is, there comes to the question of of how do we deal with this as a as a traditional art form rather than than as kind of a the intellectual or political or cultural or social pursuit. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And, and uh, thanks to everybody for this uh, really interesting conversation. I see we've got all three of our panelists ready to weigh back in. So you guys can unmute yourselves and join back in as you like. Feel free. I know we've got others waiting also. So I just wanted to say, um, so for me, when I think educator, it, it does not have to be a scholar. I just wanted to say that for the record. It does not have to be a scholar, it does not have to be an academic, it does not have to be somebody who has um, certain letters behind their name. Um, that That is not necessary at all. I think it's somebody, an artist who's interested in the music, the history, the larger, bigger picture, um, about including more people into this conversation and in reshaping people's ideas that are limited about this music. Um, so I think anyone who wants to do that, any artist who wants to do that um, in any small or big way is an educator. Um, so I just I just wanted to say that. And also um, just personally in, in my own work, in my own work as an academic, my own personal feeling about that, because somebody put in the chat about academics not doing, could do better work to cross over to other audiences and to speak to other audiences. And that is something that I'm very, very personally passionate about is writing things in a way um, that's legible to all kinds of people and not just folks um, in, in my small little circle and my small little bubble in the academy. So so I think that that that, as I said, I don't feel like it actually has to be an either or. Um, I think, you know, artists can can educate. I think academics can do a better job of um, crossing that divide and talking to people who are not just in their bubble, um, et cetera. So I just wanted to say that. Um, hi, my name is Barry. Um, I'm a claw hammer banjo player. I live in Denver um, and I also work for the the music venue and school Swallow Hill Music. And one thing that, um, you know, in this conversation, which is fantastic, thank you for, um, for facilitating it, is venues also have a role um, and, and they have a role in obvious ways, which is maybe um, how they book, how they bring people together, but also at the events um, have staff that are capable of helping create a space that is open. And then when opportunities present themselves for education, they can happen in, in conversational ways um, in big and small ways. One thing I always think about is um, as a banjo player, I don't play a lot of um, old time music anymore. I play more original music, but anytime I meet a kid and they ask me about my banjo, I tell them about the African origins of the banjo. And it's just become something that's become natural with my conversation. So it's something you got to practice and get more comfortable with. And then, um, and then a lot of times at concerts, whether it's what we call old time or even bluegrass, which is maybe more common, there's still a lot of Carter family tunes. So I like to tell people, um, you know, when people say this is white music, I tell them about Leslie Riddle, who helped AP Carter on his. Um, song finding mission. So there's so many ways to bring this up conversationally and casually and hopefully in a way that people are in their comfort zones. 
And, and so I think venues have a role and I think, you know, just, just regular people, which ultimately we all are in our own ways. So um, thanks again. Uh, if I could jump in, uh, I want to go back to Dan's question and what John also spoke to just about, you know, if, if this is fundamentally racist music, can we play it? And I think that that really speaks to how beautiful this moment of reclamation is. Um, and really the paradox when it comes to old time and, you know, I focus on country music, but that, you know, while the music has been sold based on exclusion, it's actually incredibly diverse. Um, so for me, that's the great paradox is that even though it's been marketed in such a narrow and exclusionary way, it has the potential to be such a unifying force. Um, by reclaiming that that history, and um, you know, I think today it's that's why it's all the more important to to center Black, Brown, Indigenous, people of color artists. You know, to uh, to try to work on correcting that long and very troubling history. So to me, it's like it it's that paradox where it could be something so beautiful. Thank you for saying that. I was going to say something very similar um, in response. Um, it, coming back to this idea of reclamation is that um, there is also this radical lineage in old time music. I mean, look at um, Addie Graham came from a family of abolitionists. She sang abolitionist ballads, you know, look at Sarah Ogan Gunning and Molly Jackson, you know, Look at the Southern Folk Cultural Revival Project where Elizabeth Cotton and Doc Boggs became really good friends while touring throughout the South. Like there's also a radical lineage in this music that has always been fighting for change. And I think it's ignoring all of those people and all of those voices by um, saying, should we just not be playing this? Um, there is that paradox for sure. But I think by learning and also recentering, like talking about Ralph Stanley and his mother, like instead of always framing people as, oh, this person influenced uh, this person or um, Arnold Schultz influenced Bill Monroe, so we should care about him. What about just Arnold Schultz, <laughs> you know? Like, I think it's this decentering of these central like white male figures and white women figures um, and not just looking at the people who influenced them, but actually looking at quote unquote, the others that aren't, um, that we haven't learned about in our kind of standardized history of this music and then we find this reclamation and then we find the answers I think to a lot of these questions. Uh, Greg can I jump in at this point? Uh, okay you can hear me oh, that's good all right um, the sun's just coming up here in uh, South Australia and I've got to be off with my son to a, a uh, driving test but I just uh, would like to uh, Thank the Greg and, um, and people putting this on. Great to see uh, lots of friends on the panel here. Kate, uh, Aaron, James. Um, my interest in this is uh, one of self-education. I, I really feel like an outsider. My work is in uh, Western Swing, uh, which I'm not sure if it falls under the uh, under the, the umbrella of old time, but uh, a more racist and or... Uh, um, um, or misogynistic um, form is would be very difficult to find, um, I think. Um, so you're dealing with uh, with specific complaints of um, um, of racist association minstrelsy, uh, and I can see where this is is a, a very um, acute problem, uh, a question for uh, for old time musicians. But mine, by working through this, and I've been following this discussion with Giddens' work and the decolonizing ethnomusicology people and uh, Dwayne Moore's um, um, uh, fabulous project. Um, and it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a large, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to work through it in a, in a larger context of cultural appropriation, the bad stuff and cultural borrowing, which I was taught as, a, uh, as an undergraduate, the good stuff. Um, and in working through um, an article, I think it's a book or an article, James O. Young, Cultural Appropriation in the Arts. He's a philosopher and, and he's, he's, and it, it's sort of, it's opening this up, uh, the, the question of 
is, is is appropriation good? Is it when is it bad? When is is it good? And and there, he's, he's, there's a whole book of uh, that he's he's written um, considering the different uh, uh, the different aspects of of this. Um, and so all I can say is I'm 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 really I'm working myself through it, trying to uh, try to find a uh, uh, find a um, um, a solution for playing the music, but also as an, an academic for discussing the music as an outsider. Um, so, I mean, one of the uh, specific, my specific uh, uh, area is Hawaiian in influence within Western swing and thus country music and then you know, sort of within popular music as a whole, which is uh, of great interest to me and my instruments over here. Anyway, thank you very much. I, I, I wish I could stay. I'll, I'll watch the... Uh, um, the, uh, the, the video. Um, thanks very much and have a great day. Thank you, Guy. Good to see and hear from you. Uh, let's go to James who's been waiting. Go ahead. James. Yeah, I, I just have more of a question than a comment, I guess. Um, we've been talking a lot about about race and connecting to the last comment on appropriation. I'm I'm thinking about class as well. And I wonder, I'm kind of new to this discourse. I've read a little bit and I'm preparing to teach a little bit about folk music more generally. And um, I want to talk about old time, but I wonder if people have, if there's as lively a debate as there has been over the last couple of decades about race and old time music, if there if there's as li lively a debate about um, what I, I guess you might call it like class appropriation, right? Where it's people who are connected to the academy. It's also people who have the money to travel to, you know, Asheville or wherever these, you know, week long camps are happening. You know, it, 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 I, I grew up in, uh, in West Virginia and, um, you know, I was on the, on the river, not in the mountains and no one I knew was involved in string music at all, you know, of, regardless of their class. But I wonder, like, you know, to what to what degree this is something that's come up among you folks who are specialists in this. The class appropriation may not be exactly the right term, but maybe that gets at the matter a little bit. I'd love to hear what anyone thinks. Great question. I know we've got several people with hands up, but before we get to them, if any of our panelists or anybody else wants to chime in. Uh, on this point that, that James raised, which I think is worth exploring a bit. Go ahead. I think the revival is really filled with those class issues that you're talking about. I mean, in some ways, that is what the revival is, was class middle class appropriation of rural and working class music. And then the latter part you're talking about, which is the kind of contemporary maturation of particularly old time music into this sort of camp based uh, thing. Uh, I mean, that I actually, there are people who are working on that. I'm just sort of interested on and I'm interested in reading that work because to me, it's a, it's a very clear transition in the revival into this other thing, this sort of uh, rarefied uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, for profit uh, variant of the revival. So I, 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 those are absolutely critical issues. And, you know, you can't separate region and revival uh, and all these racial and questions from the class questions at all. It's a, absolutely essential. And actually, we probably should have run. All. <laughs> Greg and I should have put up, maybe we'll do another one just on that, because that's, that's a great point. I have a quick uh, response to that, to what James said. I think that that's a really smart question and the class appropriation is different from just class because I think that um, we're seeing a shift in the scholarship where for so long it was basically about class right but the shift to class appropriation is very different and I think speaks to um, how scholarship is moving away from you know discourses surrounding like authenticity and this music being real um, so I, I get into that a little bit with, with class appropriation, um, but that is something that I would like to see so much more of. Just to, because I think that um, so much of how we think about these marketing categories, you know, 
if if we look at the the people on the ground, you know, it, it, it's not truly representative, you know. Um, so I think that overall in the scholarship, there's a trend towards unpacking the kind of um, incorrect uh, definitions that have been presented as the kind of real type of old time music. But again, I would be, I'm very looking forward to seeing more scholarship on class appropriation. I just want to respond to um, this idea about camps a little bit. Um, I definitely think, before I go into that though, I definitely think class appropriation um, is a conversation that needs to happen more. Um, and I, especially, I think it's related to, well, it's related to a lot of things, but you see a lot of these kind of nostalgic um, interpretations of what people think old time music should look like. Um, and more often than not, that interpretation is performed by middle-class white people um, and it becomes a sort of minstrelsy. So I think that's definitely a, um, an important conversation to have. Um, I wanna respond to the camp thing though, cause I am a little bit more knowledgeable about that. Um, I actually wrote my thesis about fiddle, the fiddle camp phenomenon. And um, one of the things that I think is the kind of the scariest part about the camp phenomenon is the way that it um, becomes a networking site. And so people who can afford to go to fiddle camps then get opportunities. And this is also like my own experience. I come from a middle-class background in Oregon and I went to a bunch of fiddle camps growing up and I met all my mentors at fiddle camps who produced my albums, who you know got my career started. And if I hadn't gone to these fiddle camps, I wouldn't have, you know, started my performance career as a 13 year old in Oregon, you know? So I think that um, that is a huge thing that is coming up um, a lot more with camps and then who goes to camps, um, you get all this experience and then now all the music schools um, that have like American roots programs, I think those often like funnel in from camps to the, to the kind of the general um, institutionalization of traditional music. Um, if you're interested in, in um, talking more about fiddle camps, I, that's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So reach out. I, uh, thank you, Tatiana. I also want to say that that's uh, certainly a topic that we're going to get into more in the April uh, event, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is about community and sustainability. So I expect that we'll get into dis some discussion of institutional education and camps and, and other related things. Um, of course, that's all connected to what we're talking about today, as we all know. Uh, Jasmine, you've had your hand up. We haven't heard from you yet. Please join us. Hi, thank you so much. These discussions have been so fruitful. Um, and I was just curious because um, a lot of the work that I focus on is uh, storytelling and counter storytelling and the critical race tradition. And in old time music and especially country music too, um, stories, right? Stories are such a central element and storytelling is so powerful. It creates these emotional bonds. And I'm just curious as to how um, you might have confronted this legacy of storytelling that, that may be one of the, the elements of keeping um, whiteness as a central figure in old time music making. Specifically what I'm thinking about is how this music, right, that gets passed down generation to generation, this becomes somebody's sense of self, right? The way they identify themselves, the way they understand themselves in the community and the world. Uh, there's these legacies, these emotional, powerful bonds. I'm wondering how do we dismantle, right, um, whiteness? How do we deal with these problems of race when there's such personal and emotional connections and bonds? Right. If there's this nostalgic element and there's this notion of heritage that's carried through these practices. So I'm just curious about if any of you have thought about that and, you know, um, how we can confront that personal and emotional issue. Really good question really good point that Jasmine brought up. Anybody want to uh, 
weigh in on that before we uh, proceed to the other folks who've had their hands raised who might want to say other things? I'm hesitant to respond because I feel like I've been talking a lot. So before I say anything, does anyone else have a response? I have a response, perhaps not entirely on topic, but I've been thinking the degree to which, to which people in our society are not just one thing. So we may be Southerners, in my case, with a Jewish dad. And people who play this music often are not one thing. I mean, many great old-time musicians also have some facility in bluegrass or other fields. Um, and so I, I would hate to get too focused on um, people, again, there's only one thing. And as an example, I was fortunate to know a bunch of these revivalists and still do, including notably Hazel Dickens, with whom I toured some and played on her records. And while you know no one is more of an exemplar of the Appalachian tradition and those ballads and everything she did so supremely well. But as a person, she wasn't a hillbilly. I mean, she lived in Washington for decades and Rant was the manager of a store and was very interested in nice clothes. And she was just a really complex, interesting, funny person who would, um, we would, waste an opportunity if we viewed people like that only as their background, only as their parents and grandparents. So it's a little harder, but it's worthwhile to take people as entire beings with a range of influences and backgrounds. Oh yeah, I just, just if I could jump in just to counter, um, I just wanna say that I'm not trying to like essentialize and put everybody in one box. Um, it's just thinking, right, about people's personal connections. And it could be from a very individual perspective and all the different aspects of their identity that come together and get tied into old time music performance or um, however they engage with the community. So, yeah. So uh, that, Jasmine, your question really ties in with the very interesting series of answers to Dan's provocative question earlier about uh, you know what do we do with this music at this at, at this juncture in our our history and the the connection that occurs to me is that my my first answer to Dan's question would be that I really can't think of a genre of music that hasn't been formative, it, has, it hasn't had white supremacy as a formative element to it, either in the way that white supremacy has marginalized cultures that the, the, the music comes from, or that if someone who's not from that culture is playing it, they are to some degree engaging in cultural appropriation. So, you know, there's not really an escape hatch as such um, even if you're making original music, your whole idea of music is, is formed out of what you've heard all your life. And that's going to include a lot of those, those different genres. So that the, you know, one way that I try to, to look at that is that the you know, music is, a, we all play old time music partly because we love it, because it's beautiful to us, because it appeals to something in us personally. And so the, you know, the kind of the other side of the coin is that it is an avenue towards empathy. And if you, if you, you know, address it in, in that, from that direction, there are, it, offers all sorts of ways that people can reach out and make connections and 
look at the way those stories in our lives that and those kinds of things that people think of as heritage connect interconnect and reveal sometimes the very painful interconnections but give us an opportunity to to start to work on those which of course is is you know one of the purposes of this unconference right um so so that uh you know, before you you sort of decide that you got to jump off the boat, um, we can we can start to look at the ways we can join together and and uh, you know plug the leaks and make it a boat that that we're all comfortable in. Um, and and uh, you know, I think to you know some of the people that I first learned old time music from, um, Ernie Carpenter and Melvin Wine had all kinds of stories that were, you know, their, their family history, their personal heritage. It wasn't the sort of broad brush of, oh, it's, you know, I'm a Southerner, it's Southern culture. It's like my great grandfather did this, or the, you know, this tune I learned from, from, uh, you know, Jilly Grace or, or what have you. Um, and I think I'll just stop there, but, the, but, you know, that to me is is something that's important not to lose sight of is that the music gives us a, a an avenue towards empathy and starting to understand each other because i do think that if the if you don't believe that people can understand each other in profound ways across cultural gulfs then you know what's the project right if, if you can't reach each other where you know where does that leave us so I, for me i have to believe that this music and and people's shared love for it give us ways to make these important contacts and to start to work through the the painful history but it's a lot of work, you know, it's not, it's not, it's certainly not the, you know, what I'm trying to say is not at all, oh, music is the universal language and, and uh, so if you play a tune, we're all happy, but rather it gives us an avenue towards doing that important work. Jasmine's point and the responses to it to really pick up on some of the stuff that came up the, la the first session of the unconference, which was about the revival and a lot of the kind of, there were a lot of comments of people, you know, who now many decades into a, re a revival of a totally revived tradition where, you know, grew up within it. Um, so what does that mean, you know, in terms of people who are, you know, their stories wrapped up in this latter part of it, but, you know, kind of following into the topics for today, when we were planning this and Tatiana uh, threw out a term that, that I'm going to use, I'm going to weaponize it to make Craig uncomfortable in his boat that he wants to be comfortable in, which is this notion that it's not about plugging holes and, and making it ship right. It's uh, Tatiana's idea was that the she called it genre queering. So it's the whole idea that the whole, the whole, you know, reason to stick with any kind of genre is being, that's just kind of a moment that that's has passed is passing in our time right now. And so maybe I can toss the, I don't know, I don't want to put touch on on the spot with that, but I, that, that, that idea of kind of queering the whole approach to old time, I just found incredibly interesting and, and I, I didn't want it to get lost before you were out of time today. Well, I want to respond to a couple of things. First of all, re what Jasmine was saying about storytelling um, and then the responses to that. Um, I think that the storytelling tradition within old time music um, can be really problematic as th this is why we're having this conversation because the storytelling tradition that we're used to in old time music leaves stuff out. <laughs> So it's not just about respecting the storytelling, like listen to those stories, obviously, but also we need to be questioning, like um, questioning those stories um, and also questioning these like 
figures that we have that we hold in such high esteem and we can still learn from them, but also like questioning, um, not just hearing the stories like these kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, creation myths um, behind these figures. Um, that's the kind of storytelling that I think we're often used to in the old time community. So I think um, my what I heard Jasmine saying is not that we shouldn't listen to people's stories or that we sh is that we should be um, re-questioning or, or reinterpreting stories, um, reframing stories. Um, and it seemed like maybe that got a little bit lost in the responses. So I wanted to say that. Um, and then talking about the genre querying, um, I mean, I don't really, I feel like it would be really, I would love to hear Kimberly and Amanda talk about um, their perspective fields because I think it's, there's so much um, connect, connected between country and blues and old time. And I feel like part of the genre querying process is um, seeing that these uh, genres are connected like string band if you think of old time music not as old time but as string band music like there's blues string bands country string bands square dance bands so maybe this is a chance to open it up and talk a little bit more about that well I I'd just like to say really quickly about the storytelling so my whole book is about storytelling and it's about it's about narrative self-invention in the blues and you know so I'm, I'm sort of sitting here and thinking about well yeah I mean you know, it so many of the same things that that everyone's talking about with old time. You can you can talk about with the blues. I mean, it's it's very similar in terms of, you know, these ideas of authenticity that's racialized. These ideas of, about authenticity that's class based, etc. Blues had obviously multiple revivals as well, um, and and so I just want to echo this whole idea of of, of storytelling. In in my book, I look at it very much as it being constructed and it being fictional, you know, and uh, uh, by design, you know. Um, and so I think this comes back to, you know, I feel like this is the thing I've been kind of harping on all afternoon, but I, but I really am committed to it. Like this idea of, you know, as Tatiana was saying, if you are re-approaching these stories and these narratives through, you know, uh, like, you know, telling these new stories and, and educating people about these things that they don't know, then you get new stories. And then over time, another generation will have new stories, <laughs> you know, but I think it really is about, you know, I think narrative and, and, and these ideas that people have and what they grow up hearing and what they, and what they think is true, it's really powerful. And so it's an idea about correcting, you know, the historical record and, you know, and correcting that through narrative. And then over time, things might shift. Um, so, so yeah, I just want to kind of echo what Tatiana was saying. Any other comments, particularly about, uh, this idea of narrative and self-fashioning that, uh, Kim just talked about, um, or the genre queering uh, idea uh, that Dan and Tatiana mentioned. I just want to respond to Kimberly real quick. When you're talking about kind of the fictional component to the stories um, or the narratives in the context of blues, I'm thinking about um, the what are the fictional components in the narratives and stories in old time music too. And and, you know, that's part of the storytelling is they become, you know, like, you know, magical realism, like that is storytelling. They kind of become more and more like loopy as they continue on. Um, and sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's dangerous. So maybe that's something that the old time community can um, think about is what are the fictional components um, to the story? Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to say just really super quickly that um, in, in my book, I'm really looking at it in, in, in around blues because so much of this idea of blues authenticity is racialized and it is, you know, and it is based on this idea that, you know, 
folks have to be in a, in a particular body or come from a certain kind of um, geographical or class background in order to perform the blues honestly. And, you know, and so my book is really just talking about how, you know, a lot of these stories, um, a lot of these origin stories or a lot of these autobiographical stories are, are and have been fictionalized and that, and that blues folks were very intentionally constructing these narratives as opposed to them, you know, them being like real narratives. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's something that, you know, this kind of self-fashioning is something that certainly goes on in the blues. And I would imagine um, it's, it's also going on in, in old time. And I would love to hear more about that too. <laughs> This was brought up by several people, I think, and also in the chat a little bit, and I just wanted to comment on it. Again, this idea of um, kind of myth building in old time music or in, in early country music, there's a long list of notable figures going back to the first decade of recorded commercial uh, old time music um, of white musicians who uh, claim a certain level of authenticity in their music by pointing to specific black influences, not just black music in general, which is another facet of it, but specific uh, situations in which these musicians um, emphasize the fact that they learned a certain tune or a certain way to play the guitar or whatever it may be from a black musician. A well-known example, of course, is Bill Monroe with Arnold Schultz, but there's John Dillashaw and Sam Hinton and Sam McGee and Hank Williams. And I mean, you could go on and on with this list. And while I think it's important to give credit to those people who influenced these iconic figures, white figures, we also have to recognize that that myth building is in a way celebrating the appropriation of that music. Um, and, you know, does that still go on today? I don't, I don't know. I mean, how much is that a factor in, I mean, old time music, musicians today in the 21st century still are taking cues in one way or another from older generations of musicians. And so maybe there's some of this that's still going on. I don't know. From the perspective of modern country music, I mean, that happens all the time, right? I mean, there's there's an incredible double standard where, you know, Little Nas X can, you know, create Old Town Road, which is one of the most successful songs of all time. Um, and it's not accepted on the country charts. And yet um, plenty of, of white male country artists are incorporating the same kind of rap hip hop trap beats and they're seen as somehow cool and it's celebrated even more. And I think that this was also the case with, um, you know, I think it was the, was it the 2017 CMAs, you know, where uh, Justin Timberlake and um, Chris Stapleton performed Tennessee Whiskey together and Brad Paisley introduced Justin Timberlake as the soul of Memphis. Um, and they were praised widely for being like so authentic and bluesy and um, and yet the, the year prior Beyonce and the Dixie Chicks played a song and intense backlash. So I think from the perspective of modern day country, it's <laughs> endemic to it. Dan, you got another question you want to throw out to take us into the home stretch here? We got about five minutes. Uh, you know, I was just thinking that the question of how to fashion a way forward is exactly what underlays the whole sustainable, like making it a sustainable culture for whatever it is that we're, you know, string band music or self fashioning narratives within American vernacular music or old time music, whatever we want to call it. I think the question of what makes it and and how it becomes a sustainable culture and where sustainable culture lives does it live within us does it live in a you know how does how do institutions factor in it, it, it's almost like we planned this perfectly correct because all of the all of the themes have kind of worked together 
they're all intertwined. I think it's impossible to separate them, but um, hopefully everyone will spend a month thinking about all of the challenges that everybody threw out here and then tie it into a question of making it sustainable in the 21st century, which is not the same as, as, as a sustainable culture we used to be, if it is sustainable. I have my own theories, but I'm gonna not tell anybody till next time. So, but I really truly, uh, you know, we're looking for further challenges next month. So I'll just throw that out there, I guess. That sort of feels like a wrap up, uh, Dan, and a, and a nice setup and, and segue into the April session. So let me just uh, remind everyone that's going to be April 16th. Um, I'm not sure the exact hour because that'll depend on the availability of our invited panelists and we're still working that out, but um, I hope you will join us. Um, thanks to everyone for um, tuning in, for participating, uh, especially thanks to Amanda and Kim and Tatiana. Uh, thanks to Tiffany for helping us with the logistics. And, um, you know, we will uh, get this up on the Center for Popular Music's channel on YouTube. You can go back and watch uh, the first month's unconference if you, uh, if you missed it. Um, and I just want to thank all of you again. This has been a really um, provocative and stimulating discussion. Well, thank you all. Enjoy your weekends, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.